how one side hustle show listener built a seven figure agency starting as a side project and then removed himself from the business all in less than four years. What's up? What's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the side hustle show. It's the business podcast. You can actually apply. Strap in for this one. We're going from idea to a million dollars ARR annual recurring revenue for a productized service business called Video Husky, which provides unlimited video editing for its clients. Justin Tan is the founder, while not a video creator or editor himself. He's here today to walk us through the initial validation and growth stages of the business, how he found his customers, the growing pains along the way, and some real talk on managing for profits and not revenue, dealing with burnout, and his ultimate decision to step away from the day-to-day. Your free listener-only bonus for this week is my list of 101 service business ideas you might be able to apply a similar model to. You can download that at the show notes for this episode at sidehustlenation.com slash husky. It's H-U-S-K-Y. Or if you don't like typing in URLs, can't blame you, just follow the show notes link in the episode description of your podcast app. I'll be back with my top takeaways from this chat with Justin after the interview. Ready? Let's do it. In early 2018, uh, at the time I was living in Hong Kong and running a lot of Facebook ads for various local businesses. And it was around that time that Facebook was really pushing video ads. So they were cheaper, they were more effective, and also clients love them because video is just better than photos. But what we repeatedly found were clients wouldn't be able to produce good videos for us to promote on Facebook. And so after this happened three or four times, I realized this might actually be a problem. And having seen what Design Pickle did, actually having first listened to the Design Pickle episode with you, Nick, that provided a bit of inspiration as to how I might be able to take that same model, but apply it to video editing. And so I think it was March 1st, that's like Video Husky's birthday in my head. Uh, I said, 90 days, I brought on one who was my friend at the time, editor, and he said, look, I got 90 days, Whoa, the goal is to get us 10 clients. And that was pretty much how we started. That was like the, from, in my mind, if we could get there, that would validate it. Okay, absolutely. So kind of giving yourself a a near term deadline to hit and a goal <laughs> line of the sand to say, look, if you don't, if you don't get 10 clients, let's just bag this and go back to running the Facebook ad business. Yeah, essentially. So it's the Facebook ad business still continue to run on the side, although I didn't really think as much about getting new clients. The real focus was trying to get to that magical 10 client mark, which had its challenges. Okay. So you got the idea, you got, you know, one video editor friend of yours who's kind of in the, in your back pocket saying like, okay, if I do sign somebody up, at least I can fulfill the work because you're not a video editor yourself. No, no, can't, can't edit a video for, <laughs> yeah, nobody wants me to edit a video, that's for sure. Okay, that's helpful to know. So not something that's born necessarily out of your own skill set, but something that's born out of a pain point that you saw while running this other business. So what happens next? How do you go from zero to 10 or do you, or do you get there? All right, so we can essentially fast forward to day 86 because at that point we had four clients not a good place. And of those four clients, I think three of them came from my Facebook ad business and it was obvious they were not a good fit. So really we had maybe one good fit client. But what worked for us was actually doing a special offer within the DC forum. So DC is the Dynamite Circle, uh, the host of the TNBA podcast run that as a forum. And we did an offer, I think it was some kind of a special rate, but we promoted there and as it turns out within the dc there were a good number of youtubers who were struggling with this exact problem and so we're on day 86 there was nothing um and ironically that post actually was there i think maybe two months in so day 60 somebody revived it that got a bunch more traffic and then all of a sudden out of nowhere we went from four to ten in the last uh, four days and brought on another editor to help with managing some of that work Okay, so kind of playing the tactic of, well, where are my target customers already hanging out? I'm already a member of this community for entrepreneurs. So why don't we make a thread and try and try and gather some of those people to be my clients? How do you make that post without it being overtly self-promotional? Or is that allowed? That was kind of like the name of the game. Like, hey, look, I'm starting this thing. Here's a special offer for, you know, beta members or something. So I think there's a, there's two sides to this, right? And I think the people who get it really right are indie hackers where they say, follow along my journey. And so when they post about their ideas, they're able to at least get some interest. And that interest 
generally speaking, isn't from who their client ideally are. But that might already be enough for the people who are interested in said project to um, show it to their friends who might be the actual right fit client. In our case, that's exactly what happened with Video Husky. While the DC is not a YouTubers or video creators forum, there were enough people there who knew YouTubers who said, wait a second, this might not be a fit for me, but it's a good fit for this guy I know or my friend. And so that's really what got it rolling. And when you frame it as kind of like a sharing your story, then it becomes less self-promotional. Okay. And really tapping into your network's network in that sense, you know, becoming known, just getting the word out, like becoming known for a specific problem that you solve. So people, you know, have an easy referral to make if they know somebody who might have that same problem. Was anybody else doing this at the time? Like what was the, like, were you displacing anybody, uh, another service provider? Were you displacing, you know, the, the YouTuber or the creator, like doing it themselves? So the only competitor that we knew at the time, I think, was VidChops. Beyond them, I couldn't find anybody else. And so it felt like it was a relatively new idea. And all of the early clients that we worked with um, for the next, like even the next year, for the most part, were people who either edited themselves or were working with freelancers. And each of those solutions had their own inherent challenges. Okay, so the existing solutions were very, in their early stages, you know, one similar productized service and then you could go hire a freelance editor from Upwork, from Fiverr, from wherever. But unique in the packaging or somewhat unique in the packaging. How did you figure out how much to charge for this thing? Oh, man. I just, <laughs> I saw Design Pickle. I think at the time they were charging 370 I figured video editing is a higher value, uh, higher value ad. So I just made it, uh, I think, 495 That was our starting price way back in the day. Okay. What are you at today? Today we have two packages. I think one's at... 550 and then one to 750. Okay. And this is like based on the number of videos you want turned around. Like you set some, set some guidance or set some limitations on it. So your people just aren't completely overworked or people aren't taking advantage of you. Yeah, essentially that's the, that's a key. So, um, with video, especially there are just so many variables in place, right? Between file size, number of cuts, time, skill level for the editor. So for each package, we just kind of have to narrow the scope down that you know, enables an editor to be able to do each task um, well on a sustainable, repeated basis. Where are you finding, well, I guess at this point, so now you have two uh, editors on the team to try and uh, fulfill the work that's coming in? Yeah, yeah. At this point, I think we're around June. Yeah, June 2018. Okay. And these are still friends, colleagues? Like, where are you going to source the supply side of the of the service? Yeah, so the first one was the boyfriend of a personal friend. And so um, he's still around. His name's Ken. He, he's done pretty much every role. But our second hire, Paul, and our third hire, Mervic, were off of Upwork. And so I had just pulled them after doing a couple of test jobs. And after that, it was actually Paul, our second editor, who eventually became our head of hiring. He had been a freelancer for the longest time. And so from there, he started tapping into all of his, his own sources and saying, hey, um, this is a cool gig. And that's actually how we got our hiring ball rolling. Okay. And this may be an interesting way to, you know, if you were to pivot Video Husky to a different niche, is to just scroll through the endless available categories that are on Upwork, that are on Fiverr, and say, oh, could we sell this as a recurring service? Could we sell this as a recurring service? And there's hundreds of different categories. Other side, I think it's a great source for you know, service business inspiration in a lot of ways. And then maybe even the people on the platform become your first workers on that. But you just have to you know, come up with this branding and packaging and, in a way that there's any margin left over. And so how did you think about that in terms of, well, if you know, client A sends, you know, five videos a month and client B, say, you know, talk to me about kind of matching the workload with the team to handle that. Oh, so that's, I think one of the biggest challenges of me personally, not being technical when it comes to video editing, I don't know what's hard and I don't know what's easy. There are certain videos where it's like, for example, this podcast, right? Um, that requires a certain amount of editing, which can be easy for a certain type of editor, but for another type who isn't as strong with audio, it might be an entire struggle. And so I didn't appreciate how important it was to match the right video to the right editor. And so I just kept on throwing videos and clients to our editors and hoping it would all work out. Okay, so matching up the 
editor with the skills that really align with what the video creator is looking for? Was it the point of everybody getting a dedicated editor? Did people want that? Or they like, look, I don't care. I'm going to dump mine into the work queue and whoever can tackle it, tackles it. So what we found was it was pretty important to build the client editor relationship. And so we would keep that as constant as possible. Of course, there are times where, you know, our editor is taking time off, gets sick and whatnot. Then um, part of the service, of course, is you get a backup editor to make sure your workflow is uninterrupted. That client editor um, relationship is really key. And so I think one of the mistakes, I think when I like look back was I always assumed that uh, what the ed an editor and a client each are the same, but what kind of was underlooked at the time was the chemistry that that's built up. And so you can't just go and swap somebody else in between um, because they don't understand the details. Right. And I'm, so I've been a subscriber to podcast fast track for podcast editing, like really similar service, just audio only for years and years. And it's really helpful to have that dedicated person who kind of knows your preferences over time. And I mean, you know, I think I'm on my third or fourth editor with them. They've all been great. So that makes sense. I was curious how you handled that part. Okay. So 90 days goes by, you got your first 10 clients, you know, the bulk of them come in at this last ditch, you know, promotional effort at the very end. So what happens after that? So in June, um, we got to those 10 clients. Uh, I decided, you know what, we're going to go gung-ho all in. Um, we're going to hire a third editor and promptly lose half our clients. So it went from 10 to back to five. Um, oh. Yeah, so that was a little bit rough. <laughs> what happened? Uh, they just we didn't have the use for the service or what was going on? Yeah, so a lot of it came down to client fit, which is part of the issue. It's just certain clients would have certain types of videos that they needed for um, a period of time. So I think at the time, um, we had a few like yoga studios that we were working with and um, video just wasn't in their wheelhouse. Like they needed a couple done and that was it. So what what happened during that time was I think over that three months, we couldn't get any more clients, which is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, but what we realized is there is a specific kind of person that we really deliver value for. The type of content creator who is uploading one, two, three videos a week because it's so core to their exact work. And that was a big lesson that we learned at that time. Okay, so yeah, I'm really focusing on the specific type of client who is constantly creating this stuff because yeah, that's the, that's a big pain point for them to take this off my plate. Yeah, exactly. So how'd you go about finding more YouTubers or more content creators to uh, keep this thing growing? So at the same time, I started working with a couple of people who'd founded productized services. I think Alex McLafferty and Russ Perry. So they did WP Curve and Design Pickle, respectively. And I think working with them really helped me think through how we were putting positioning ourselves in front of clients. And what it came back to after talking with them was realizing that my own skill set, um, which was Facebook ads, made a lot of sense for something like Video Husky. And so I think it was around August 2018 at that point that we decided to run our first Facebook ad campaign. And that was when it really started to unlock a growth channel. And I think from there, we were able to scale up relatively quickly, which I wouldn't have imagined as possible beforehand. Okay, interesting. So rather than going into YouTuber, Facebook groups or communities, like, let, let's just target these people with ads. We already know the ad game. We know the video game. Let's go out and find people this way. Do you remember an early ad or two that you know was compelling, converted well for you? Yeah. So the great thing about Facebook ads, if you have a little bit of budget to play around with them, is you get to test all the different kinds of angles, right? And what we found was working with people who had previously hired editors we were much more suited to working with them than trying to convince somebody who had only edited their own videos in the past. And so because we were able to use that as our angle on Facebook ads, we were consistently bringing in the right kind of client. And so I think it was something along the lines of the stresses of ghosting editor freelancers getting to you. And so uh, if that's the case, try us out. Um, we're a flat monthly fee, unlimited editing subscription that will we'll always have your back. And so I think that was one of our ads actually worked out quite well. Okay. So instead of convincing somebody that they need to outsource this stuff, it's like, no, somebody who already has decided that and is just looking for a better, faster, cheaper solution to that same problem. Yeah, exactly. Because it's just when you're working with somebody who is outsourcing video editing for the first time, there are so many more hurdles to go through, so many more beliefs that they have to overcome or change. And so 
that's really not where you want to be operating, or at least for us. Um, working with somebody who got it just made it so much easier. Okay, fair enough. And what happened after these Facebook ads start running? I'm looking at kind of the growth chart here, and it seems to <laughs> have a big inflection point. Yeah, so unlocking Facebook ads really just unlocked everything for us. I think for the next year, we consistently grew like 10 to 20% month on month all the way until I think October of the next year, 2019. So that entire year was uh, got us to about the 83K MRR mark. For that hallowed uh, million dollar uh, run rate, huh? Yep. And so um, it was a it was a crazy year, that's for sure. So now we're at that million dollar run rate, but the Video Husky story is just getting started. Still to come in this episode, Justin's burnout, an employee crisis, what happened when COVID hit? I'll give you a hint, it wasn't good. And what ultimately worked to save the business and took Justin out of the driver's seat. One thing I think contributed to Justin's success was his willingness to take imperfect action. Entrepreneurship can be messy, but if you're sitting around waiting for the perfect idea or the perfect timing, you might be stuck on the sidelines for a long time. That's why Steph Taylor hosts the Imperfect Action Podcast. Like Justin, she built a million-dollar online business from the ground up in just a few short years. But she'll openly admit she made every mistake along the way. Her show shares the strategies she wishes she'd known when she was just dreaming up her business plan from that corporate cubicle. It shares the advice she wishes she'd had when she was juggling painful clients, answering those client calls at 3 a.m., and wondering if she would ever find financial freedom with her business. Tune in to Imperfect Action for bite-sized strategies to build a business that brings you more profit, more freedom, and even more joy. Steph helps online entrepreneurs and brands launch and relaunch their offerings to serve more people and make a greater impact. Give Imperfect Action a listen today. You can find it at imperfectactionpodcast.com or your favorite podcast app. Big thanks to Steph and Imperfect Action for sponsoring the show. We talk a lot about email marketing and social media on the show, but for every email you send, what kind of open rate are you seeing? 20%, 40%? If you're hitting those numbers, you're actually doing pretty well, but it still means the majority of your list isn't seeing your stuff. And on the social media side, only a small fraction of your followers are likely to see your posts. So what can we do instead? Our new sponsor, Simple Texting, makes it easy, fast, and affordable to actually reach your customers. I mean, look at your own phone. How many unread texts do you have compared to the number of unread emails? With simple texting, you can have two-way conversations and trigger automated text messages for things like appointment reminders, text for info programs, sending files and lead magnets, and more. And it works for every kind of business to cut through the clutter. These kinds of services used to be pretty expensive, but plans with simple texting start at just $29 a month. If you've never tried SMS marketing, simple texting is making it easy to get started, and they're hooking Side Hustle Show listeners up with 500 additional credits added to your account. To claim that deal, just text the word HUSTLE to 833-2-TRY-SMS, and you'll get an additional 500 credits added to your simple texting account. Again, that's HUSTLE to 833 833- 287-9767. I'll be sure to include those details in the show notes for this episode and in our big list of Side Hustle Show sponsors at SideHustleNation.com slash deals. Big thanks to Simple Texting for sponsoring the show. I believe it. And trying to match supply uh, and demand, like hiring editors to come along with clients as they come on board. Did you have a rule of thumb that, okay, well, every editor we bring on, I assume we're bringing these people on full time, they can handle three, four, five client, like what's that, what's that magic number for you? Yeah, it just depends on the package that we have. So at some points, uh, we tested all different kinds of numbers, but we typically ratio it somewhere between three to five, depending on the package, because like, as you scale up and whatnot, the other kind of key challenge that we faced that I didn't really um, understand was working with a small team is very different to working with a team of all of a sudden when you have 40 or 50. The difficulty in matching the right client to right editor increases and so when that happens not only are you potentially losing clients because they're not happy since the first editor isn't um, doing the right kind of work um, you might also lose editors and if you have to lose on both sides that's a really kind of tough flywheel to overcome but if you can do it correctly that goes a long long way um, which we kind of had to figure out the hard way do you have an example of that where it just it wasn't a fit or didn't work out 
Yeah. So I think part of like this again goes back to some of my own naivety around video editing, right? Because I don't understand what kinds of videos are difficult. We would used to allow all kinds of editors to all kinds of clients to come in. And I think one guy in particular used to send something like a hundred gigabytes worth of footage and expect the video to be done in two days time. You know, and we had one guy with amazing internet. And so he would download all the footage and he would get it done in two days. This editor, I think his name is James. He was a superstar. He really killed it for this one client, except it came at the cost of the his other couple of clients. And so what might be a win in one hand is that like a small win might actually be a big loss overall. And so uh, I think that was a pretty good example of, you know, when we realized that, oh, wait a second, we have to find a better way to balance this out. And everybody is remote at this point and probably still is. It's a 100% remote team. Yeah, yeah, we're 100% remote team. It's still hiring through Upwork? Where are you finding all these people? So from, from what Paul told me, a lot of them actually come through Facebook groups. That was something that was relatively popular. And I think since then, we've also gotten a good number of referrals from our own editors, which we found is actually the best source of hires. It's if you can get um, people to introduce their friends, yeah, it just goes a long, long way. Okay. That makes sense. What kind of tech stack or, you know, infrastructure are you using to, I mean, one is the logistics of just transferring these huge files, uh, you know, big hundred, you mentioned hundred gig video files and just communicating amongst this team and making sure everybody knows what they're supposed to be working on at what time. All right. So the main thing that kind of holds it all together for us is Rike. Um, it's like a project management tool, but the key feature of it is that it has a video proofing feature. And so, for example, if um, if there's a YouTuber who submitted a video um, and they needed a few edits, they could literally just pause on the video. Um, there's a marker you can draw on it and say, hey, at this one point, um, you didn't allow for enough audio to play or um, uh, okay. your color grading is off. And so that kind of really helped to smoothen out the miscommunication process, which is something that apparently was a big deal previously for a lot of our clients. And so... Uh, Rike is our central point where we accept jobs and we're able to deliver files. But then beyond that, in terms of receiving files, we get it off of their Google Drives or OneDrives. And then we just deposit it straight in or occasionally upload it for them to their YouTube channel if uh, if that's what they want. Okay. And then are the payments process just recurring through Stripe or something? Yeah, yeah. So then from there, um, everything happens through Stripe and just kind of a lot that allows it to go through seamlessly. Okay. And Rike is W R I K E, I believe. Anything else you swear by on the tools and tech side? For us, Microsoft Teams. I know everybody uses Slack, but uh, that's actually worked out quite well for us. And so I have, I have no complaints with them. And uh, yeah, it goes a long way to both have Rike and Teams as kind of like our internal and external methods of communication. Okay. So now you're. A year and a half into this, you're sitting at this million dollar annual run rate. You know, are you thinking, I'm I'm this entrepreneurial genius, look at me, I struck, you know, I struck gold with this thing. What's, you know, what's going through your head at this point? So the moment that I hit that point, that was when I kind of lost all motivation. Um, (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) go go figure. I think I had basically two things I wanted to do in my kind of like young adult life, which was a nomad and build a seven figure online business. And so it's like one of those classic things where when you set a goal uh, and you hit it, you realize, oh, wait a second. Oh, what now? And that was the feeling that I had. And so for the next like two, three months, I just started going through the motions. I wasn't paying attention. And that's when it actually caused us a pretty big problem when it came to Christmas time, because it re- um, we realized that a lot of our editors had actually saved up their leaves to go um, to take Christmas holidays off, except we hadn't planned for that. Uh, we had a leave policy where we thought people would kind of take it evenly throughout the year. It wasn't the case, and everybody wanted to um, leaves off at the same time, which meant we wouldn't have enough editors in place to service all of our clients. And so because my I wasn't paying attention, my, my eye was off the ball, um, that kind of crept up on us, and it made me realize, wow, um, both in terms of the scale of the team, which was around 40 to 50 people at the time. Also, the actual challenge of figuring out who are we prioritizing here, the clients and their work during December, or our editors and who who specifically wanted to um, take time off during Christmas. That was something that I really struggled with, actually. How did you end up overcoming? What was the solution? 
So the solution in my head was clients always right. And so I said, no, we're like for people who want to take Christmas leave off. Sorry, we had to deny it. And suffice it to say, that was the wrong move. Uh, after we made that announcement, I had a couple of team members who knew me better, more personally, message me separately and go, Justin, like this is not a tenable situation. And I go, what do you mean? And they go, uh, you got to look at some of these group chats. And they hid the names of uh, the various editors and whatnot, but just the amount of disappointment and anger that kind of came out from the editor team made me realize, oh, wait a second, I've done something wrong here. And as I spoke with some of our middle management and tried to understand the situation, I realized that, well, for one, I know this sounds almost ridiculous, but Christmas meant a lot to our editors, uh, specifically coming from Philippines. It was a big deal versus in my head, holidays were always just, oh, it's so much better when you can take them whenever you want, not on set dates when everything's expensive. And so that's one of like the I think, entrepreneurial lessons that really was useful and helpful for me was realizing that I had applied my own solution across the board. And that was an example of where by doing that, I wasn't actually considerate of our staff and what mattered to them. Because if we hadn't gone through that process, I wouldn't have been able to see how differently everybody appreciates kind of their own way of life. Yeah. And hopefully clients, especially clients who've been with you for some time, they understand, look, it's holiday time. We're, t we're taking a week off as a company or something like I don't know, what was the reaction on the client side? Yeah, and so that's like, that's exactly what happened. We decided to take a week off, um, wouldn't affect any of our editors' leaves, and I was so, so scared. Uh, <laughs> I thought we were going to have refunds, riots, and whatnot, but as it turns out, like 90% of our clients were happy. Some even brought up tipping their editors, which was something new for us as well, and, we were, and I think it was at that point that I realized, oh, it's like my own beliefs, my own perceptions are not reality, and so there's a lot to be said about really really understanding um, the perspective of other people, uh, clients, staff, and finding that middle ground that works for everybody. Do you ever run into the situation of an editor or a client trying to cut you out of the picture? Uh, surprisingly, no. But we did have an issue where one time we had a, an editor who left, tried to bring his clients with him. That didn't really work out particularly well for him just because uh, the client's as it turns out, didn't really enjoy working with him and uh, we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're glad to, uh, to have been moved to better editors. But uh, that, that, ha that did happen one time. Okay. And what metrics are you paying attention to at this point? Are you looking at the churn? Are you looking at lifetime value? Like what's, you know, what's kind of on your you know, CEO dashboard? Around that time, um, after we had gotten to just past that million dollar run rate, the thing that I really paid a lot of attention to was consistently getting more clients. And that's really different to, I guess, the way that I see things now because getting more clients while um, is, like, I guess, like the best feeling has a certain amount of like limits as to how that actually feels like growth of your company because what feels like growth of your company isn't just new clients, it's net new clients, both incoming and churn clients. And so... I think one big difference of now to before is we really pay attention to bringing in better quality clients because even as we kind of did an analysis of all of the clients we've ever worked with, turns out our the top 20% of our clients, the best ones, they don't pay like five or 10 times more. They're paying something along the lines of 50 times more in lifetime revenue than our worst clients. And so it was something that was quite fascinating to look at. And how do you go out and find more of, the, more of those people? So that's actually what we had to do post-COVID. After COVID came, we lost a bunch of our clients. Uh, we realized, wow, we have a lot of staff. We don't have that many clients. What are we going to do? And I read this book by Mike Michalowicz, uh, his less favorite book, Pumpkin Plan, Not Profit First. And he had a cool little strategy within it, which was to take the list of all of your clients, rank them by revenue, and then identify your kind of high paying favorite customers and interview them. And then by interviewing them, you would be able to figure out not only what messaging appealed to them and what value did they get out of your service, but you could also find out where did they hang out. And actually, so by going through that process of interviewing our best clients, we were able to, well, the way that Mike Michalowicz put it was clone your best clients. And so okay. while we couldn't do that exactly, we were able to find a lot more similar fit clients that that more than made up for the 30 or 40% of business that we lost because of COVID. Yes, yeah, so you're running, and maybe this is an appropriate time to talk about margins. So running 
relatively lean to the bottom line, it sounds like. We've got you know, 40 or 50 editors. And so when COVID strikes and you all of a sudden lose a big chunk of the client base, then that kind of puts the company in the red. Am I hearing that correctly? Oh, yeah. There were a couple of months there where it was not pretty. Okay. Is there a way that you think about a target margin on a monthly basis, on a client basis? Like, Talk me through what, what might make sense for somebody looking at a similar productized service. Yeah. So before COVID, all I really cared about was revenue just to continue growing that. And I figured, oh, we'll get profitable later. But I think that was a really big mistake that I had made. And because of COVID, we kind of had to structure it right. So I started working with this one company called Clever Profits, also a productized service. But their thing was um, more man- like management accounting. So they would kind of go through all of your expenses with you and they would teach you exactly where you were overspending and underspending in your relative to, you know, like your type of business. And that for me was eye opening because I realized before that point, I kind of operated Video Husky with a marketer's mindset. But by working with them, understanding the financials, I was slowly trying to, I guess, learn the learn a different aspect of being a business owner by understanding the numbers. And so by figuring out the unit economics of our business, what a good kind of gross margin looks like for an online productized service or agency, which in my head is around 70%. That goes a long way in ensuring your product is actually scalable profitably. Because if not, then you're just running yourself into the ground. Okay. So gross margin of 70% means you bring in $1,000 in client revenue and you have 30% in fixed costs, like the the editor talent in this case. Am I Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's helpful to think about and definitely helpful for people kind of going through that upwork list of potential productized services here. This COVID impact, you mentioned like prior to that, losing the motivation and having to answer the, well, I hit my goal, what's next kind of question. So, you know, where are you at headspace wise? Like, no, now now the company's losing money. Now I got to get back into the day-to-day grind. You know, we solved our employee mutiny situation over the holidays, but like, ah, now we're getting back into this. And I, I don't know, do I, do I really want to be doing this day to day? So the good thing, I guess, about our staff holiday crisis, and then COVID as a crisis is all, you don't have the luxury of thinking about all your own personal problems, right? Because your back's up against the wall, you need to be able to you know, figure out a solution. And so I think the combination of those two events, kind of it snapped me out of my funk a little bit, although it was more postponed it, uh, which we'll come to in a bit, I guess. But kind of realizing, oh, we're unprofitable, we need to figure this out, that delayed the whole, what am I going to do in the future by about another year. Towards the end of 2020, things started to even out, things started to be figured out. We got kind of beyond uh, where we were. So we ended 2021, actually, str- sorry, 2020 stronger than 2019. Yeah, so that was actually good for us. And it was around that time that the same thought started popping up in my head again. It was like, okay, so now what? What's the future for this? What's the future for me? And I couldn't really shake that feeling anymore. Yeah, you mentioned Alex from WP Curve. They ended up settling to GoDaddy, if I recall correctly. I mean, Russ is still running Design Pickle, as far as I know, and it's an even bigger business now than it was uh, five years ago when we recorded. So what's, I mean, are you thinking... I'm eyeing an exit down the road? So at that point, I wasn't sure. All I knew was that I was quite burnt out. I think the back-to-back crises made me realize that, number one, I did not enjoy management. I'm not really somebody cut out to ensure the day-to-day and the week-to-week, everything aligns and we're moving forward in the right direction. And I think doing that properly for a year really taught me that lesson. And so I started considering other solutions, whether it was just minimizing my own role or while not really selling, just seeing ways that I could step out. Yeah. What was the the day to day and that like so you mentioned, oh we gotta I gotta manage this huge team. Am I you're still are you still running marketing? Like what's your what's your role? Yeah. So at that point I was still running marketing and we still had our um set of weekly calls that had to happen to ensure things kind of ran smoothly. And and I think as we kind of went through more and more of those as we set like a good weekly cadence, I just realized that There was a pretty big disconnect for me personally between both me and our clients because I personally am not a video creator. I don't know how to film. I don't know how to edit. I don't know how to, I guess, promote. I don't particularly enjoy promoting myself or our editors because I don't have the a creative eye. As I said already, I don't know how to edit. And so I realized that lack of sort of 
founder market fit and founder product fit was really hindering, I guess, my own ability to to apply myself in Video Husky. Okay, so you think, well, it may not be sellable where it's at today, or I'm not quite ready to let go of it, but I do want to outsource myself from the day to day. I want to like, you know, bring in somebody else to be the operator or the COO in a way. Is that what happens? Yeah. So it was around, I think, beginning of 2021 that I started working with another coach, Taylor Pearson. And so working with him kind of made me realize, okay, this is really not my role. Uh, even though, of course, like at the end of it, I am responsible for Video Husky. I feel a lot of responsibility for the team that I just could not continue on a day-to-day basis. And he kind of outlined the consequences of a person running a team when they're already burnt out. And it turns out that this is a thing around the four to five year mark, a lot of founders get burnt out. And the key is to kind of already have a team in place that you can transition to so that when that burnout inevitably happens, your team is still good to go, your business is still good to go, and it can run without you. Yeah. And so he was the one who outlined kind of like what a sale process would look like and what the uh, multiple would be, which wasn't all that attractive to me, just because it's three to four times earnings, five if you're really lucky. Compared to the idea of, let's say, bring on a general manager where I personally might earn a little bit less, but it would mean that the business would continue to spell out dividends, which would be enough to live off of while the GM would have the opportunity to grow the business while reducing the kind of key man risk that the business was reliant on me, which also ironically makes it more sellable in the long run. Yeah, it was, and this is an interesting kind of fork in the road, and I won't name names, but I was talking to some friends at FinCon, who had gone down, maybe not, not a completely similar path, but you know they went down the path instead of you know doing a clean you know one and done, cut me a big check, I'm getting out of here, sell the business, exit. They went down the path of kind of bringing on a partner with the hopes, well maybe the partner can grow the business. I'm kind of in this burnout phase. I don't really want to work on it day to day, but then the partner ends up just tanking everything. So it's a huge risk for you as the business owner. They can take what we've already built and they can take it to the next level, but they could also screw things up. Like they could also upset the clients. They could also upset the team. They just might not be the right cultural fit. Like, you know, we might have another crisis where 30% of the clients leave again. Like it's a risky proposition versus, you know, almost taking the money in and, and just so, you know, washing your hands of the whole thing in a, in a sale. Yeah. And so I think that was something that I was willing to give a shot for. So the way I figured it was the absolute worst case scenario is that if it turns out he's not a good fit after one, two, three, six months, well, I guess like I'll step back in and I'm exactly where I'm at. But at least I had a three to six month break, which maybe would be enough kind of fuel to get started again. But while there are downside risks of potentially doing like worse than what Video Husky was, there was also the upside risk of doing better than what Video Husky was previously doing. And in my head, it made sense because at the end of the day, I have limited business experience. I had never managed a team of 50. So I never would have made a lot of mistakes versus bringing on somebody who had that experience, who had already worked at a higher level than where I was at. I think there was something to be said about about that kind of know-how that I really wanted to bring to Video Husky and our team because not only am I, but like our entire team is just so young that we can either learn from experience or ideally learn from other people's experiences and get to where uh, we want to go faster. Yeah, I think you're mature beyond your years to recognize the limitations and shortcomings in your own experience. I think a lot of founders are like, no, I founded this thing. I'm taking it, you know, I'm taking it all the way. Was it on the editor side? Was there a trait or traits that you looked for in the hiring process that separated the people that eventually came on board versus versus the ones who said, ah, this isn't going to be a great fit. So the interesting thing with hiring editors, and I guess I learned a lot also from our hiring manager, Paul, was he said you could always tell who would be a good editor just instantly based on their submission. Um, Because what he would do is he would ask people to do a test edit, but more important than that, he would ask them to explain why they made certain choices. And the way they explained their choices was way more important than the edit themselves because it showed how a person viewed editing, how they viewed the job, because you can always work on somebody's skills, but it's much harder to work on somebody's creative perspective. And I thought that was a really cool um, tidbit that he had shared. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful for other people kind of in the same model, uh, thinking about hiring. It's like not just the technical skill, but the you know the why behind the thinking behind that. And that's something we're working on 
with our kids. Yeah, you got the right answer, but why'd you come up with that? Or how'd you come up with that? Like a, something that we're uh, working on uh, as well. Anything it, like crazy client stories, anything that surprised you along the way, aside from, you know, the employee mutiny or other uh, crises that you had to deal with? Just curious if there's, you know, something that stands out in your mind from the last four or five years. I think there's two things. So the first is, I guess, when you work in the video creative space, you get to work to see a lot of different kinds of uh, businesses, right? And we worked with all kinds of creators, one of which my favorite, I think, was this YouTube channel where this, where this woman taught other people how to be a mermaid. And she monetized it by selling mermaid tails. And so I remember when we started working on her videos, like, dang, you know what? If she can do this, you can build a business off of anything. So I think that was something that was surprisingly like a little bit underrated, but like eye-opening for me. And the second is that your best client really is worth a lot more than your worst client. What we realized was of all the clients that worked at Video Husky, 20% of them brought in 70% of all the revenue, which probably represents something like 80 or 90% of all the profit. And once we really factored it in, of the bottom 50% of other clients who worked at Video Husky, they were probably unprofitable. So they not only didn't make us money, they probably actually actively lost us money because of the expenses associated with advertising, onboarding, marketing, sales, and what have you. And so there is something to be said about really not like doubling down on your best clients, but like valuing them at a 10x, 100x level because that's what they really are to you. Did you end up having to fire some clients to say like if they're just unrealistic in their expectations on turnaround time or revisions or, you know, number of videos process to say like, I'm sorry, sir, you know, we did the analysis, you fall in our bottom 20%, you're probably unprofitable, we can no longer take your business. Yeah, so we actually did get to that point. Um, of course, we didn't instantly fire everybody, you know, all at once. But like, we gradually kind of started to let go of clients who were not a good fit. And what we found, at least for us, were agencies, especially were not good fits for our workflow or for our, like editor morale. And so like over time, we began to, um, number one, we stopped letting agencies sign up with Video Husky, but beyond that, started letting them go kind of one by one, two by two, um, to the point that like, I think for the past couple of years now, we haven't worked with any agencies. Okay. And just, you know, hopefully they don't renew or say, sorry, <laughs> your, your renewal price is going to be X. I don't know. Like there's a different ways around it, trying to make it unattractive without having to, you know, have those hard conversations. But What's uh, what's next for you? So you've removed yourself from the day-to-day. You've got your general manager in place. What's got you excited these days? So th- most of this year just has been kind of post-COVID, like enjoying a little bit of nomading with my girlfriend. She's setting up her own productized service. So a little bit of working to- together on that. But beyond that... Ooh, plug it. What's it, all, what's it all about? Plug it here. It's a grant writing business. So flat monthly fee. And she works with a lot of NGOs specifically in Australia over, you know, how to apply for the right grants and get them done in a kind of specific, quick, specific manner. So yeah, that's been her, her project this year and she's done quite well. So very proud of her. Do you have a URL for it? Oh yeah. Uh, AlyssaMedway.com. All right. So it's just under her, uh, her projects or services. All right. Well, we'll link it up in the show notes. And the other thing that I've been doing recently is just part-time consulting for other product as service businesses and kind of helping them scale up with revenue and their team. Very good. It sounds like mentorship played a key role for you early on with Alex and Russ and now returning the favor for the next generation of product as service entrepreneurs. Yeah, that's the plan. You've got justintan.me. You're on Twitter at JT7TH and of course, videohusky.com. Appreciate you joining me, sharing the ins and outs and ups and downs of really a roller coaster ride and you know something that took off like a rocket ship and has had its bumps along the way, but has uh, emerged on the other side, I think stronger for it and uh, and yourself as well. So let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for side hustle nation. Uh, my number one tip, if you can afford to after a little bit of scale, is to hire a virtual assistant. There are so many things that go that happen in a day that uh, require our attention, but bringing one on, especially when we're in the middle of growing Video Husky, I think just saved me so many frustrating hours of little things like figuring out flights or ordering groceries. And that's the kind of like intangible stuff that can really add up over over years. Well, very good. Justin, appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you sharing all this stuff. Thanks so much for joining me and we'll catch up with you soon. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. 
All right, my top takeaways from this call with Justin, number one is mentorship. This is becoming something of a common theme, but if there's a shortcut to success, mentorship has got to be pretty high on that list. The right advice from somebody who's already seen your future because they've been through it, that can be worth quite a bit. I thought it was really wise and mature of Justin to seek out coaching and mentorship, and that was something that stood out to me in this call. An important note here is if you don't have the budget for it, you might be able to pick up a lot for free from podcasts like this, from books, or even from a lower-priced group coaching or mentorship program if such a thing exists. I remember in my call with Donald Spann, who had built and sold a virtual receptionist business, he talked about listening to every interview the founder of Ruby Receptionists gave. Her business was the market leader he was trying to emulate, and he was able to glean a lot through that type of informal virtual coaching in a way. So that was takeaway number one, the value of mentorship. Number two is to get clear on your ideal customer. And you may not know who that is if you're just getting started. So if you're just getting started, don't stress too much about it. But I thought it was worth mentioning how Video Husky started by just in practicing the underrated entrepreneurial skill of simply paying attention. He was already in business, but encountered a new pain slash problem slash opportunity in video editing. It's an example of how opportunities become visible once you're already in motion. But it turns out that those local business clients he was running Facebook ads for weren't the ideal customer for Video Husky. They weren't consistently creating new video content as a core strategy to their business. So it was a focus on content creators instead, and specifically content creators who were already open to outsourcing that really ended up being the right client fit. And I loved his uh, pumpkin plan exercise uh, from Mike Michalowicz of ranking your customers in doing the 80-20 analysis uh, of which ones are the most profitable, the most fun to work with. And then on the other side, which ones might not be worth the headache? I do this from time to time with my affiliate partners, and it almost always leads to some new content ideas or some conversations on how to better optimize performance. So that's takeaway number two, get clear on your ideal customer. And my final note here is that revenue does not equal profit. From the standpoint of complexity, I'd probably rather run a $100,000 business with 100% profit margins than a million dollar business with 10% profit margins. The bottom line in both cases is the same, but with extra overhead, you add risk, you add complexity. And in most cases, I'd venture to guess it just takes more skill to manage and operate that beast. So this is my call to uh, mind your margins, both in your business and your personal life. You don't pay rent with revenue. We heard Justin mention that they target 70% gross profit margins on labor, and we've heard from other side hustle show guests ranging really from 40 to 70% on that figure, but those are the dollars that you have to cover the rest of your overhead, your marketing budget, your tools and software, your income as the owner, and for that reason, I've paid almost zero attention to top-line revenue in my businesses over the years. It's not relevant to me. It's the net income at the end of the month and at the end of the year that counts. So that's takeaway number three. Revenue does not equal profit. Your free listener bonus for this week is my list of 101 service business ideas that you might be able to apply a similar video husky style model to. You can download that at the show notes for this episode at sidehustlenation.com slash husky or if you don't like typing in URLs, just hit the show notes link in the episode description of your podcast app. Now, what to listen to next? We've got several productized service business examples in the archives, including the Russ Perry episode that Justin referenced at the top of the show. That's episode 248. If you scroll back through the archives, you can learn how Russ took Design Pickle, unlimited graphic design service, from idea to over $400,000 in monthly revenue in under three years episode 248. There's a lot of gold in that one. And another one you might like is Tyler Gillespie in episode 430. Tyler at that time had built and sold Applause Lab, a video testimonial productized service. And he talked through his ideation and growth phase, along with five ways service business owners can set themselves up for a successful exit, including one I referenced quite a bit, the laptop test. I kind of wrote down five different ways that other service businesses could actually think about designing their business for an exit and some of the things I implemented and thought about as well. Um, and the first one was passing the laptop test. Um, and essentially what I mean by this is if you closed your laptop today, how long would your business survive? 
And that's really important because if someone's going to buy your business, it's a huge tell like how dependent the business is on you. Um, and the more team you can have implemented and built around yourself um, where you could close your laptop and step away for two weeks a month, which is like kind of the goal I try to set, then the better off your business is going to be. That's going to be really attractive for an investor. For the other four ways to design your business for an exit and make yourself more attractive to an investor, definitely check out that episode with Tyler, episode 430 of the Side Hustle Show. You can scroll back through your player app to find that one. Lots of other great stuff in there as well. Big thanks to Justin for sharing his insight. Thanks to the Imperfect Action podcast and Simple Texting for sponsoring this week. Tune into Imperfect Action for your dose of mindset advice actionable marketing tips, and strategies to build a business that brings you more profit, more freedom, and more joy. You can find it at imperfectactionpodcast.com or your favorite podcast app and simpletexting.com. Cut through the clutter with your business with the help of text message marketing. To get started, just text the word HUSTLE to 833-2-TRY-SMS and you'll get an additional 500 credits added to your account. That is it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen and I'll catch you in the next edition of The Side Hustle Show. Hustle on.